Hello. Today we will begin the 13th lecture on systematic theology. Roman numeral 3, Characteristics of the Union Between Christ and Believers. Capital A, The Union Between Christ and Believers is a Spiritual Union. The born-again spirits of believers have been united with Christ in spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Hence, believers can live in holiness in Christ. Capital B, it is a union of life. Believers received eternal life in Christ and have been united with Christ. 1 John chapter 5 verses 11 through 12 says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. John chapter 15 verse 5 says, I am the vine you are the branches. If man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Therefore, when believers live in Christ, they can bear an abundance of fruit of faith. Capital C, it is an organic union. Christ is the head and believers are his body. Therefore, believers must receive the guidance of Christ as well as his wisdom and power so that they could obey God's will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 14 through 21. Capital D. It is a union that can never be destroyed. The union between Christ and believers can never be destroyed. Therefore, the salvation of believers is complete and forever guaranteed. John chapter 10 verse 28 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Capital E, it is a mysterious union. The union between Christ and believers is God's mystical spirit that man cannot comprehend with his thoughts. Thus, the truth of this secret is recognized only through faith. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Roman numeral 4, Method of Union between Christ and believers. 
Believers are united through the power of the Holy Spirit. The union of Christ and believers does not take place through the strength of man or through natural ways. First Corinthians chapter twelve verse thirteen says, "For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks." Slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Believers were united with Christ in His death. Galatians chapter two verse twenty says, "I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live." But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. This means that the old self of the believer has been crucified with Christ on the cross. Believers have also been united with Christ in His resurrection. Ephesians chapter two verse five says, "Made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved." Roman numeral five. Results of union between Christ and believers. Capital A, believers died to sin. Believers have been united with the cross of Christ, and the old self of believers died with Christ. Now believers do not receive. The punishment of hell, because they have died to sin. Because believers have died to sin, they can avoid the temptations of sin, in order to live godly lives. Romans chapter six, verses six through eleven says. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Capital B, believers have been made alive with God. Believers have been united with. The resurrection of Christ. Ephesians chapter two verse five says, "Made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions." The spirits of believers were dead in transgressions. Believers' spirits died. As a result of sin, before they believed in the gospel, believers' spirits died, which means that they did not know or love God, but were cut off from God in life. Yet, when we believed in the gospel, our spirits came to life. With Christ, the spirits of believers were made alive. This indicates the reborn spirit. John chapter three verses six through seven says, "Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit." 
You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. Capital C. Believers can now live in Christ. The spirits of believers have been united with Christ. Therefore, Christ is in believers, and believers are in Christ. Hence, believers can have a relationship with Christ in Christ. This takes place in the spiritual world. First Corinthians chapter one verse nine says, "God who has called you into fellowship with His Son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful." We have a relationship with Christ. Which indicates life with love for Christ and joy through Christ. This is because the spirits of believers have been united with Christ. Capital D. It leads to the union of believers. All believers have been united with Christ, and hence all believers have become one in heart and will to please God. First Corinthians chapter twelve verse thirteen says, "For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body." Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Chapter six: Believers become children of God. Believers become children of God through faith in the gospel. John chapter one verse twelve. However, believers are not children of God in the same way that Jesus is the Son of God. Christ is both man and God. Believers are human, but they are not God. Therefore, believers are God's adopted sons. Romans chapter eight verse fifteen says, "For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father." Adopted sons are given the status of a son by law. Therefore, believers are God's adopted sons, but they have received privileges and responsibilities from God as His children. Roman numeral one. Privileges as children of God. Capital A. Children of God have been liberated from the condemnation of the law. Everyone is born a sinner. Sinners must die under the condemnation of God, and their souls. Must receive curses in hell. However, believers who have become children of God are liberated from the condemnation of the law, and they have been called righteous. Romans chapter eight verse one says, 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Capital B, children of God, call God Father. Children of God call God Father, and they are able to have a pleasant relationship with God. Life with a relationship with God is the most joyful and pleasant life anyone can have. Also, when believers pray to God the Father, God hears them. However, those who do not know God are like orphans, and there is no true satisfaction, even if they possess all things of the world. It is a great blessing to have believed in Jesus and become children of God. Capital C. Children of God can live godly lives in the Holy Spirit. God sent the Holy Spirit so that His children could live godly lives. The Holy Spirit, who dwells in believers, helps believers believe in the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. The Holy Spirit also helps believers recognize the truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. Hence, when we hear God's word, we gain strength to believe, understand, and obey. The Holy Spirit also helps believers bear fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 23 speak of nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. Believers can only bear beautiful fruit because of the power of of the Holy Spirit. Capital D, Children of God Receive the Inheritance of Heaven. Children receive the inheritance of their parents. Children of God, believers, receive heaven as inheritance. When believers die, their souls enter heaven. When Christ returns, the bodies of believers will resurrect and will enjoy eternal life in heaven in bodies that never die. Now we will move on to studies about the time of when believers become adopted sons of God. Roman numeral 2, Aspects of Adoption Capital A, God predestined that believers become his adopted sons even before creation. Believers of the Old Testament times were adopted sons of God. However, they were like children. Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. Why are they called children? They looked forward to the coming Christ and they believed. John chapter 8, verse 56. 
they did not receive the helper, Holy Spirit, and they were slaves to the law. They observed the law and served God. They looked upon the redemption of the coming Christ through the law. Capital B. Believers become adopted sons when they believe in Jesus Christ. In the New Testament times, believers become adopted sons of God the moment they believe in the redemption of the cross and resurrection of Christ. Believers of the New Testament times received the Helper Holy Spirit. The Helper Holy Spirit gives grace so that men can believe in Christ. We receive eternal life in Christ and are united with Christ. Therefore, if believers of the Old Testament times are like children, believers of the New Testament times are like adults. However, not all believers of the New Testament period are completely holy in character. When believers of the New Testament period fight against sin and obey God's word, they will grow holier in character. Capital C. Believers will become whole when Jesus Christ returns. The believers' bodies will resurrect, and their souls and bodies will become completely holy when Christ returns. Believers will resurrect in complete living bodies. Believers will also resurrect in holy bodies that are without sin. Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 through 21 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Chapter 7, Sanctification Sanctification is the process of change into a holy being. Sanctification is not a condition that sinners must meet in order to receive salvation. Sanctification is a moral responsibility that saved believers must seek. Therefore, believers must strive to accomplish sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Roman numeral 1, Definition of Sanctification Sanctification is the process of change in a child of God in becoming holy through prayer and God's Word in the Holy Spirit. The word holiness is derived 
from the Hebrew verb kadash. Kadash means to be set apart, to sanctify, to cut. The term holiness is usually applied to God. God is without sin and is pure, and He is set apart from all of creation. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. God is also set apart from all creation in terms of his divine honor and glory. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 says, And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Believers are called holy because they have become clean through the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, believers live holy lives when they turn away from sin and live clean lives. Believers are also holy because they have honor and glory as children of God. Therefore, believers live holy lives when they live as children of God wherever they go. Believers are also holy because they dedicate themselves to God. Because God is holy, anything that is dedicated to God or belonging to God is considered holy. Numbers chapter 16 verse 38 speaks of men who sinned at the cost of their lives. They overlaid the altar for they were presented before the Lord and have become holy. God bought believers with the blood of Christ, and hence they have become God's possession. Therefore, believers must offer their bodies and hearts in whole to God and they live holy lives when they obey the will of God. Roman numeral 2, the characteristics of sanctification. Capital A, the creator of sanctification is God. Sanctification begins when God renews the sinner and gives him a new and holy life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 11 says, And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When believers are born again, they are made holier through cooperation with God and through the gracious means of God. Again, believers become holier through prayer and obedience to God's Word. Capital B, Sanctification is the process of moral recreation. Justification is God's declaration 
that man is lawfully righteous. However, sanctification is the believer's act in becoming more and more like God in his holiness in character. This is God's act of moral recreation. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 Capital C, Sanctification is a Continual Process Justification and Regeneration are completed at once. However, Sanctification is a process that continues until the death of the believer. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Capital D, Sanctification of the Body is Completed at Resurrection. Sanctification of the body is completed at the resurrection of the believer. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21 says, Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Roman numeral 3, Aspects of Sanctification Capital A, Positional Sanctification Positional sanctification refers to the status of the believer that is made holy. Believers are made righteous from the moment they believe in Christ and they receive eternal life and become children of God. Paul told the church at Corinth that while they were not whole in their actions, they became holier. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 says, To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. Capital B, Progressive Sanctification Progressive Sanctification is the continual change in the believer's character in becoming holy until the moment of death. Believers must put away the old self and put on the new self daily. The old self lives for himself and thus he is flesh-centered, chases after greed, and puts his hope in the world. However, the new self lives for God's glory. The new self obeys God's word. The new self is of the Spirit and puts his hope in heaven. Thus, when the believer lives as the new self, he can become more like the holy image of Christ. The image of Christ is a holy character that thinks, speaks, and acts as Christ did. Capital C Ultimate Sanctification Ultimate sanctification is accomplished at the second coming of Jesus Christ. When believers resurrect 
their bodies and spirits will be completely holy. When believers resurrect, their bodies will become glorious, and they will not sin. The resurrected body also does not grow old or sick, and it never dies. It is also a complete body that is not limited by time or space, and will live forever in heaven. This is ultimate sanctification. Roman numeral four, sanctification and good works. Capital A. The nature of good works. Sanctification allows believers to inevitably bear fruit of good works. Good works stem from love for God. First John chapter five verse three says, "This is love for God." To obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. The purpose in doing good works is for the glory of God. Matthew chapter five verse sixteen says, "In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds." And praise your Father in heaven. First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirty one says, "So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God." Good works are accomplished through obedience to God's word. Second Timothy chapter three verses sixteen through seventeen says, "All Scripture is God breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work." When we obey God's word, goodness is accomplished, and when we disobey God's word, we commit sin. Capital B, good works do not contribute to salvation. This is because good works are an obligation towards God. The good works of believers cannot be an asset to God. Believers have the duty to give up their lives for God. Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse thirty-seven. The good works of believers are not accomplished through their own power. The good works of believers are accomplished by God's grace and help. God gave believers new life and the Holy Spirit, and thus sanctification is possible. Ephesians chapter two verse ten. Therefore, believers cannot. Demand rewards from God for their good works. Capital C, the necessity of good works. Good works cannot be regarded as necessary to merit salvation. Good works are not a means to retain a. Hold on salvation. There are people who receive salvation without good works. 
the robber who was crucified with Jesus did not do good works, and yet he received salvation. Luke chapter twenty-three, verse forty-three. However, God requires believers to do good works. Matthew chapter five, verse sixteen. God requires good works so that He would be glorified. Good works are also fruit of faith. Believers of the gospel must bear fruit of good works. James chapter two verse twenty six. Good works are fruit of thanksgiving to God. Believers of the gospel must give thanks for God's grace and please God through their good works. Here we will conclude the thirteenth lecture on systematic theology. Thank you.